So, hi, uh, my name is Juzna, and I want to tell you about Zero Trust, which is a buzzword, and no more secrets. Actually, I like made a small change in the name of the presentation because like this, is, this makes actually, actually a bit more sense. Uh, so, let's see if uh, this makes sense at the end of the talk. Uh, who am I? Uh, I'm the technical lead at the platform security team here at QE.com. Uh, what it actually means, uh, what the platform team means, uh, is like we have about four, five hundred, uh, four or five hundred developers in Kiwi.com. So we have platform team, and our mission is to enable our product teams to develop better software faster. Uh, which means basically all the development teams they don't have to do the same stuff which they all need to do. We will do it for them. And part of the platform team we have platform security, and the job of platform security is enable our product teams to deliver software, uh, secure services and applications by default. So yeah, we try to make it as easy for them as possible to make their applications secure so that uh, all the product teams don't have to care that much about security. Actually, like uh, our vision that it should be actually hard to make security mistakes and if you do it the easy way, it should be secure uh, this way. So <clears throat> why I want to talk about secrets uh, in this talk, uh, I don't like secrets, so I want to get rid of them. The, that's my thing. So that's why I want to show you today, like, how can we get rid of the secrets and what's our idea. Uh, just a disclaimer, this is not what we are doing at the moment. This is a project which we recently proposed, and we are st still deciding if we want to do it or not. Uh, and so maybe if you like it, you can come here, you can join our team, and we can try to implement it. Uh, we would need to convince everybody else that this is actually a cool, cool idea. So this is what I'm doing now, publicly. Uh, so uh, secrets, like why I don't like them. Uh, this is one example. Uh, this is our GitLab CI. You can see like lots of secrets over here. Uh, Epic key, uh, Datadog key, GCP credentials, GitLab token, Hetzner password, blah, blah, blah. Like so, so many secrets so that something can access like all the services which it needs to access. Uh, this is how it looks in lots of our services. Uh, it, this is like from the GitLab CI, then it's deployed to production, and the production application actually is using lots of these secrets to access those services. Pretty standard in the industry. That's how it works. But uh, so why is it a problem? So you have developers, and they like to copy paste all of these to their laptop so that they can work with the services. Then all the secrets from here, from the production applications, are on laptops of like hundreds of people in the company. Then they just copy paste it to some other services because like you need a new Slack application so you can ask the Slack admins to create a new secret for you so that they can access the Slack or you can just copy paste it from here and just faster it works. So this happens and like tons of microservices actually use the same token which is meant for a completely different application. So that sucks. Uh, of course people accidentally commit it to Git all the time. Uh, they copy paste it to shared docs and it's visible in the history to others. <clears throat> they show it via Zoom, especially while recording the screen. Then the secret is again leaked. And yeah, this is all just too much pain. So like the secrets in this case, they're very easy to set up, but then like very like it's a huge pain to actually maintain it and keep rotating it. I have another example. Well, it's pain, so I didn't have time to like make the slide nice, but like let's say you leak the credentials to your database, so and you need to change it. So what do you do first? Do you change the database password or do you deploy the application? Either way, like something will not work because it takes some time. Usually, some other team needs to change the database password. Then you need to deploy the application. That can take like 15 minutes, uh, 30 minutes, and during the time, like the application actually cannot talk to the database because it still has the old password. So. It's actually like pain even to like work with the secrets if they leak. And third example is like so, so many operations. So this is what we see all the time. Like, please, can you generate me a new password? Uh, I leaked it to GitLab or something. Or people just asking for passwords and then people actually have to go, which is like one team who owns a service like PyPI. They create a user, new username, new password. They have to send it to the requester and just like too much work which is like, why do we even need to do that? Like, it should be smart and we have computers to do the work for us. So, what can we do? Uh, idea is, let's get rid of all the secrets 
and like make them go away and all these problems go away with that case. Uh, you cannot leak them, you cannot share them, you don't need to rotate them, anything. Uh, perfect. So, but how does that work? So the idea is like SSO or single sign-on, which you probably all know for humans. So like you go to any application and it's like login via Google or via Apple, via Facebook or something. You don't have to have separate password for every application. You just use the single sign-on, you log in everywhere. Especially in companies, like we have Okta, so we all log everywhere by Okta. So basically anywhere you go as a user, you log in and you are there. You don't have to have any secret, any password to log in to any service. Uh, it should work pretty much the same for the services. So how do we achieve that? Uh, JWT is a boring technology which has been around for a huge amount of time. But it works. If you haven't seen that, just super quick intro. This is how the JW token looks like. Here on the left, uh, you can see just like long string. It consists of three parts. Uh, I'll probably just show it here. So there is some like header, which you can see decoded here. This is just base64 encoded. So it's a header, what, what it is. Then content of the security token, and then some signature, which is verifying that the token is valid and nobody was playing with that. Uh, what you can see in the token, this is from, by the way, from jwt.io. There's a nice debugger, so you can play with that. You can put it, put the JWT tokens there. It will decode it and show you all of this, or you can also work the other way that you just enter the data. It will generate the tokens for you. Uh, obviously, for testing, don't put like any production secrets or like production data there. Uh, so in the, to in the JWT token, what do you have? Uh, this is the important part. So it says the issuer which means uh, accounts.google.com. It says, I, google.com, identity management, I provided this token, which is verifying this email, which is like asset inventory. For example, this is like one of our services. So the owner of this, this token, who has this, I verified it is actually asset inventory. Uh, also, the owner said, like, I want a token for something. So this is the audience. Uh, so the token is only valid if you send it to this uh, third party or this uh, service, and there's some like expiration issued at etc. So that uh, it's actually valid only a short time. So like it's a really simple thing, uh, basically just these things and the signature, which is verifying that it's secure. Uh, this is using uh, like there are two ways how you can use the JW tokens: either symmetric cryptography, which is boring and you need to share secrets, so that's just stupid and don't use that, or asymmetric crypto, where you have uh, basically, Google is signing the tokens for you, and you can easily verify it via Google's public key and uh, their certs that it's actually valid from them, and you don't have to share any secrets at all. Uh, then you can, your application can take this token, send it to some other application, and this way it can uh, like authenticate that actually that it's actually the asset inventory uh, as verified by Google, and it, the token has been issued recently in this time. So yeah, this is technology which has been there for ages, and it's so boring that most of the time you don't even hear about it, but it works pretty well. Uh, so, but there are some problems. Uh, so where do I get the token? Hmm, and isn't this like another secret? So we just got from secrets to other secrets. So what did we even solve? So. Where do we get a token? Uh, ideally from the runtime. So whatever the application is running, just ask the runtime for the secret, uh, for the JW token, and you don't need uh, anything else. And here's the example in GKE, Google Kubernetes Engine. Uh, Google provides a metadata server which is running like on this well-known address. You can just make HTTP call to that and say like, I want to have identity token for this audience. So this represents like what you saw uh, in the JWT token on the previous slide. It just gives you back the JWT token, uh, which contains all the information. <coughs> so if you are running on Google Kubernetes engine, just ask, uh, you just ask the Kubernetes engine for that and you get it. So it's super easy to get it. And if you run somewhere else, like if you run GitLab CI, it actually just passes it as environment variable. There is a CI job JWT token, and you have it. In lots of other cases, again, just like 
depends where the application is running, just ask the runtime, it should provide you with the token so that you can use it and you don't need to care like how to get it ideally. Uh, yeah, depends on where you run. So if you want to know more like specific cases, ask me and, or Google the documentation. So that's how you get it, so that's easy. And isn't it another secret? Uh, yes, a bit, but it's a very short-lived secret. Uh, unlike the tokens which you saw in the beginning in like the Slack tokens and all of that, which are valid forever, and if you leak them, they are leaked forever and they are hard to change. This is short-lived, it's usually valid for one hour only. So even if it's leaked, it's usually not a big problem because by the time somebody could actually use it to attack you, is no, not valid anymore, and actually like it's no use for devs to do anything of that, like what I mentioned before, like there's no use to copy paste it to their laptop because in one hour it will stop working, so nobody will do that. There's no reason to like, if they leak it on uh, Zoom recording, it's fine because by, by the time somebody sees the recording, it's not valid anymore. So this solves like most problems of the secret, so that's fine. So I would say, yeah, it's, those biggest concerns for that, I would say it's solved. So basically, TLDR, where are we now? Uh, we have the GWT tokens, and which is basically the single sign-on token, which can be used for any services running anywhere to talk to anything else. And you basically achieve the single sign-on for your applications, and you don't need to share any secrets anymore. Uh, but this was just the part like, okay, like how do I get all of these JWT tokens. Now, I need to be able to actually use them somewhere. Uh, otherwise, it's not useful. So where can I use that? If you call any Google services, like you need to talk, you need to edit a Google Sheet, a Google Doc, you need to talk to a storage bucket, you need to connect to a Google Cloud SQL database, anything in Google, you can use this and Google will basically look at the JWT token, it, uh, which says like, I, Google, myself, verify that the owner of the token is actually that service and that account, so it has access to that. So that's, that's super easy for them. Uh, but you can also use it in many other services like HashiCorp Vault is one of the examples. If you use that, you can just configure it and say like, okay, trust any uh, JWT tokens issued by Google and look at the email and just trust it and then uh, basically in there you can grant permissions based on that and you don't need to do any other authentication to Vault. Uh, if you want to use it in your application, you can add code to your application and, or you can use a library like uh, middleware, uh, which, yeah, which can, can be pretty simple. Uh, you can also use Google Identity Aware Proxy, which is a cool thing, which I'll mention a bit later, which is part of Load Balancer. Basically, it sits between the user and your application and it will verify the token. If it's valid, it will pass the request to the application, if not, then we'll just drop it. Or if you use Istio, which is like a hyped thing, uh, service mesh, it has a sidecar, so it has a proxy next to the application. It can also, the sidecar can verify this. And if it's valid and matches some criteria, it can pass it to the application. If not, then it will just drop the request and the request will never get to your application. Uh, so uh, just a side note. Google Identity Aware Proxy, IAP, it's a cool thing. If you use Google Cloud, I totally recommend to use it. Uh, it's part of the load balancer, so you can see the life of the request. You have the user at the top. The user sends a request, like normal HTTP request to Google Cloud load balancer. The IAP is part of that. It will verify that the user is logged in, so like normal user, like you go to the web application, which should be probably like internal only, you go there, and first time it will just redirect you to Google login. You log in, it will set up some cookie and then you are logged in and you can go to the application and it also you can use uh, Google Cloud IAM to say like which teams, which groups have access to the application. If you are not part of that, it will just drop your request and like all the way at the end, your application is here and no request will get there ever if they are not authenticated and logged in with uh, the identities which you allow to your application. Uh, this is, by the way, also great like for if somebody tries to DDoS you, they will basically just DDoS the Google Cloud Load Balancer, which is not possible to DDoS Google, and you will get no requests which are not valid. So 
totally recommend to use that even without like anything else, just for the users. Uh, uh, yeah, and you can enable the IAP either for some paths of your service. So if you have like foo.myapplic.mycompany.com, you can enable it for some some sub paths or for the whole domain, some subdomains. So you can have like internal tool dot mycompany.com and that will be behind IAP and nobody will be able to access it. So uh, yep. okay. So uh, let's try to put it all together. I will have now lots of diagrams to show you like what are all the things how we want to connect it together. So uh, this will be growing bigger and bigger. Here is the one service, for, for example, which is running in Google Cloud. It has some service account connected to it, and it wants to talk to Google Cloud, any GCP service like a storage bucket. So what it does, it just asks the metadata server, which is running there automatically. You don't need to do anything. It gets the token, sends it there. Uh, the GCP service asks, I am like, does this account have access to this bucket, to this file in the bucket? Gets answer yes or no. And Works super simple, like you don't need to pass any secret anywhere. There's nothing, even if the devs want to leak something, it's not possible, like they cannot do it. They can only leak the token which will be expired in one hour. So that's great. Uh, second example is you have service A and service B and they want to talk to each other. So it's pretty similar like for the service A, it just wants to talk to the bucket or it wants to talk to service B. So again, just ask like, Metaeser, give me a token, you pass it, uh, to the service B, and the service B can validate the token the same way how the Google Cloud service verifies that, and that works. Uh, and as I mentioned, like you can have like some middleware, or you can have Istio sidecar, or you can put it in the code of the application. Depends. Like there's hundreds of different way how to do it because it's so stupid and simple, just like simple tokens, so very easy to verify. So this is again works. Uh, this service doesn't have to know any secrets. This doesn't have to know anything, only the identity of that. Uh, again, nothing to be leaked uh, and works. So, great. <coughs> Adding more stuff. So, it's the same. Uh, now you have some employee there who wants to access the service through, the, through their browser. So that's what I mentioned, the IAP, you just uh, Set the DNS record to point the Google Cloud root bar answer. You enable IAP. The request goes straight to the service. It's validated. If it's not valid, the IAP will drop it. Super simple. The validation which you do here is basically the same if you do it this way or this way. It doesn't matter. It's the same. Pretty much the same. There are tiny differences. Uh, in this case, like it says like it's token issued by accountsgoogle.com. In this case, it says like it's issued by IAP. Right, so we just need to configure that the service B accepts tokens from two different issuers. But that's it, and again, works super simple. Uh, another example, you have a GitLab CI job somewhere running like on your dedicated runner for us. This is like in GCP, so here's like GCP public internet. GitLab CI job, or could be GitHub or anything. It has the token, it has some identity, so same way, you don't have to do anything else. You just say like, okay, like, Trust the tokens from accounts at google.com, trust the tokens from IAP, and trust the tokens from your GitLab. Your GitLab will generate uh, for any CI job a JWT token for it. Then you just pass the token. That's it, nothing else to do. And works, super simple. So that was pretty much it, like what you do. Uh, that's basically what you need for the services in production. All the cases, multiple services talking to each other, services uh, like connecting from your employees, etc. But some missing parts uh, to make it a bit more complicated because like in real life we have more use cases. So use case for bare metal, we have some services which are running not in Google Cloud, but on a bare metal provider uh, somewhere else. So I just drew a, like another line, just like this. So there's the GCP, there's internet, there is everything else, like AWS or for us OVH, Hudson or whatever else you want. So we have some service running here. Again, it wants to talk to that service. Uh, if it's on the same network, like we use the same VPC, uh, the service, uh, it cannot ask the metadata server like here because it's not there. 
This is provided by Google. This is not running in Google, so it's not there. But it can ask the Google authentication, like give me the token. So it's something like, I don't know, uh, the accounts.google.com. Just say like, yeah, give me the token. You need to log into that somehow. So you still need like some secret over here, which will authenticate you towards Google, but nothing else. Like to, you don't pass any secrets here. So it's like, a, <clears throat> it's easier to guard this one. And it's also like harder to actually like accidentally leak it. So this way, service running somewhere else, ask for the JW token, sends it to the service B, and super simple, works. Nothing to do. Uh, next case for local development. So say I'm a developer of service A, for example. I want to take service A, I want to run it on my laptop. The laptop is not in the VPC, it's here. It's basically on public internet, anywhere. Uh, you can notice we have like office or VPN here. It's not in the office or VPN. It's on public internet because like I'm at home. I don't need to connect to VPN. So what can the application do? Just pretty similar to this case. Talk to the GCP authentication. Say like, please give me a token. You get it. You pass it to the iAblue balancer. It's allowed to talk to the service. So it talks to the service. Works pretty much the same way. <coughs> Only thing that the application actually like needs to be able to ask. Uh, so the, uh, the application, if it's running here, it asks the GCP authentication. If it's running here, it asks the metadata server. So the only config which you need to have there is this, the application, what it needs to do. So again, like simple and it works. Uh, it's not that super simple. Like it needs to have some identity here in this case. So what I shown here is this is a service account, which is actually like not account for a really service. We are thinking, we don't have this running in production yet or in the local development either. So what we are thinking, like let's say have a kind of like service account, it would be a team account. And the application would be in this case using the team account to log in and pass the credentials so that here you would say application service A in production can talk to me and application or the like team account on their laptops can talk to me and nothing else. <clears throat> yep. And next thing is third party services. So let's say you want to talk to Slack, Jira, anything else. It doesn't provide this kind of authentication. And Slack only tells you like, okay, like here's the secret, just pass the secret on every request and it's valid forever. So what we are thinking is we would create, so for this outside world, we would have some outbound proxy. So instead of putting all the secrets like the Slack token here in your, into your service, you would put it here. It would be more secure. Only very few people who would have access to it. And then you would do the normal GWT, GWT authentication to the proxy. And you would send a request this way. It would fetch the token, for, for example, from Vault. Attach their like real secret, pass it to Slack, and pass the response back. So there's still the secret here, but it's bound to like this small perimeter. The application and the developers and nobody else actually can access that. Only the Slack admins would basically just pass the secrets here and nobody would be able to see them. So not that great, but you need to deal with legacy internet and what works. Seems that it could work pretty well as well. again. Like we don't have this implemented, we are still thinking about it, but we think the idea is cool so that it could work. Uh, next slide I had for some partners. So let's say we partner with some other company and we say, okay, like you have your service running in your maybe Google Cloud and you want to talk to us. Actually, there's nothing new on this picture because like if they already, it would be similar to like this case or any of that. Uh, or if they have their service A is running in like different Google Cloud, they can just like get their uh, token from the, their metadata server and pass it through the public internet through the load balancer. And this load balancer, it doesn't matter if it's verifying tokens for your, corp uh, your company or anybody else. So it, yeah, it can verify the tokens even like from your partners or from anybody else. And you don't need to share any secrets between like the two, two companies. 
So great. Yep. Uh, some more cool stuff. Uh, this is like even like this is not that well thought out, but what we could possibly do next with this is end user authentication. So let's say you have some customer support tool, which is writing to some database. And let's say like uh, you, let's say like uh, it's writing some comments to the database, and in some cases you you want to like delete the comments from your customers because like sometimes like your customer sends you like hey here's my credit card number, and if you store it like it's bad, so, but you don't want to delete like any of the comments. So maybe you are thinking like okay I have this yes customer support tool it's very big. Uh, I don't really want to allow it to delete stuff from the database because somebody from the developers or some, somebody would uh, hack the application and they would be able to delete any uh, comments from your customers from the database. So you will say, okay, like this will not allow it, but you will have separate service like which has bigger border, so like more secure, much fewer people can, can access it, uh, much fewer developers. Uh, but it's just a backend. Uh, it doesn't have any front end. From the employee, let's say this a manager, they still use the CS tool. This using the token which says like it's the user John Manager he has access to this CS tool. And this CS tool, if they if it wants to delete the secret, delete the comment from the database, it sends a request to the comments admin tool. It uses two tokens, so it says like, okay, I'm the service CS tool. So here's the token proving that I'm the CS tool. And also I will forward the token which I got from here, which is verifying that the request got there from John Manager. And Google is verifying that actually like John Manager sent the request. So if somebody hacks this and wants to send a request here and say like, yeah, the request came from John Manager, it cannot do it unless actually the person sends the request there. So if the John Manager doesn't send any request, sorry, like you cannot even spoof the request. And this tool, can either like, yeah, verify that like only the managers can delete the stuff or it can log it somewhere else and then can delete it from the database. So yeah, like you can basically pass the authentication through the chain and make the tools more secure or like you can see the whole path who connected to and who is making the requests. So that's pretty much it, what I had to show you. Uh, just super quick recap, here is the whole thingy again shown with all the pieces. Uh, what I think is pretty cool thing that the Office VPN, there's nothing because we don't care like if you're running in VPN, it's the same as public internet and you don't need to be in VPN for anything, uh, which is also like much easier for any developers for, or for, for any employees. They can just be anywhere and they always go through the app if it's a service which needs authentication. Cool, so that's it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So if you want to have questions, feel free to shoot them. Uh, as I mentioned before, we don't have this implemented. This is just now as an idea. So if you want to work on that, you can join us and convince everybody else that it's cool and that you want to work on that. <laughs> there is a question from Zdenda. How do you handle token expiration? Token renewal in services? Uh, token expiration, yeah. So, uh, yeah, because the tokens, uh, usually they are valid for one hour. So this service, it needs to fetch it like at least every hour it needs to ask the metadata server like give me a new token, give me a new one, give me a new one. Uh, so you would need to have it uh, like we are thinking about two options. Either one is like a client library so, uh, which would do it automatically for you. So let's say Python, you use requests library. So we would just provide a fin wrapper on top of request, which automatically fetches the token and attaches it and sends the request. And basically what you see in your application, you just use requests and you put some wrapper on top of that. Uh, we could also use Istio, the sidecar. So it could be running here as well. And uh, like with Istio and service mesh, usually like send the request from the service to like sidecar running here. It send it to the sidecar running somewhere else. So that sidecar would also like do the same, like fetch the token and forward it. And in that case, like usually 
you know which services you want to talk to, so you can kind of like prefetch it and uh, f uh, so you don't need to do in the blocking path, like you don't need to do when you do the first request to service B, like if you know that you'll be talking to service B, as soon as you start, you fetch the token, you just wait, and then the application does the first request, just you already have it, so we just pass it, and it doesn't slow you in any way. Uh, do we have the options to revoke the token? Uh, no, as far as I know, it's not possible. Uh, may <coughs> so, yeah, uh, actually, like, I don't know. Maybe it's possible. I don't know the JWT standard that much. So, but I think like the way how we think about it, it would not be possible. Uh, but. Yeah, because like we don't we don't check anything we uh, we don't check any revocations list or anything. Just basically, you get the token in here or the e app it gets the token and just sees the issued at and expires at. And if it's within that range, it's valid. If it's not within that range, it's not valid. So you cannot revoke the token. But if the tokens are only valid for one hour, that may be good enough because like you probably wouldn't be able to like revoke it within that time because like humans are slow. Or if you want to be like more secure, you can shorten it, you can make it one minute if you need to, and you can fetch the token every minute, uh, which should not be a problem. And then like, you would definitely not be able to revoke the token within one minute if you are a human. I'm not sure if I missed it, but how does service B know if service A can talk to it? Because for the bucket you have, it asks. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, that's I didn't mention that I was only talking about authentication, not authorization. Uh, so this is not here, and this is basically only providing like who is talking to you, not if that service has the access. But I was expecting it. So here's the backup slide. <laughs> 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 ah, I did. Uh, okay, the backup slide is wrong. I didn't manage to finish it. So uh, sorry for that. So. Uh, Ideally, you would use GCP IM, but it doesn't allow you to define custom permissions. So we have basically the same thing as here. We implement it and we had it like on the side. So it's hidden here. So, but we have like our IM and you define it like, I want these permissions to exist. So like there's a service called links and it has permissions, admin, edit, read access. And then we define roles which is links read write access. Uh, this role has these permissions. And uh, then uh, we manage like who is, who gets this role we manage uh, in a separate tool. Basically like it's done in Okta and we have some uh, custom tools built on that. So you can apply like, you can request, I want to join this role. Somebody will approve it. You will be there automatically. And then you basically have the permission. And then service B, on the request, it will send the request to AM and say like, okay, I got the token which says it's John Manager. Can John Manager do links access? It will ask our IM, it will look at this configuration and Okta group management. If the person is in this group, it will say yes, they have access. Otherwise, we will say no. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's internal service. It's doing basically completely the same thing as this one. Uh, the only reason is that like this, this only supports permission like uh, bucket, uh, I don't know, bucket get or something like that. It doesn't support permission like links access, links admin, etc. You cannot define custom permissions. Yeah, so we had to like implement. Uh, you have to build it yourself, or yeah. We build it ourselves, and it's public on GitHub as open source, so you can you can use it. Uh, Uh, it's possible. I don't know. I haven't checked anything else. Like by the time I was looking at this, it was already implemented and working. So. I just yeah, yeah. If you investigated before you started working on your own. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. This this predates me. Yeah, so question is for the recording. If, you would, if we would like to take this project, how long it would take 
to deploy in the whole company. And yeah, that's a hard part. Uh, we have no estimation. Uh, we would still have to like figure out like uh, how do we actually want to do all of this? Like, do we implement the middlewares? That would mean like implementing middlewares for like Python, Go, Node.js, uh, whatever other languages, maybe different frameworks. We could use Istio. In that case, you don't have to touch the application. We would just use the sidecar. Uh, so that could be, uh, I think that could be done like in a month or two with a small team. Uh, but then it would have to be managed overall. So like probably you would need uh, some people to actually like <coughs> provide maintenance for that. And what is the implementation? And that means like it's ready, but there are zero applications using it. If you take Kiwi with like hundreds of microservices, then we say, okay, like each of the 100, 100 microservices needs to use that. And then uh, that's, that's hard and uh, depends on like each team if they have time to actually do it or not. Uh, I think it could be pretty simple. We can either say to them like, if you want, you have the middleware. So like if you are using Python and Flask or Python IOHTP, just use this middleware. Uh, with the proof of concept which we did, it was like two lines of code to change, uh, change in the application to, or like the server side, it was like two or three lines on the client side. Like, so we hear like the requests, as I mentioned, Python requests. So like three lines to change on that. Uh, one line of that was like the import. So pretty, pretty simple and it worked, but it means you need to change the application and some dev teams may not have time for that. And for that case, we could say like, okay, we'll have the Istio, the sidecar, we'll actually do that which means the code of the application doesn't have to be changed at all. We can just redeploy it, uh, but we would need to still tell it, okay, like uh, talk to like different endpoints. So because the still just takes like, you don't say like talk to servicebcompany.com. You have to say like talk to like this local endpoint. So it still may need to require some changes to the applications. Yeah, and that can like in kiwi.com that can take months or even years. Especially for because like we have services which probably are not really maintained. Uh, there is like all the people who maintain them left the company, but they still run. Nobody wants to touch them. So <laughs> is it worth to touch them to like add this authentication? I'm not sure. <laughs> and um, is it a completely custom solution, or do you have some I don't know consultants or companies that already use something similar? So this is yeah this is comp uh, is uh, question is is this custom or do we have consultants or somebody else who's who is using this uh, this is custom uh, we looked at you know, like there are some tools which do parts of this uh, we haven't found anything which was like doing this perfectly uh, or there are some things uh, like Google Cloud provided some of these which were pretty expensive and you just like, it would be like too expensive to actually use that for such a simple thing, which it does. And that maybe we think like, uh, it would be better if we just implement it ourselves. And given it's so simple, I said like, we would probably try to implement it. Anybody else? Uh, and no other questions on the Slido. No other questions on Slido. Yeah. So okay, good. So thank you all. Uh, we can finish here. And. Uh,